grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. That was the basis. In other words, Jesus was God. And in order to serve us and save us, he humbled himself and he became a human that he might be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That was the basis. We're saved by Jesus, and he is our model for how we need to be with each other. That was the basis. So the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out here is lest somebody say, well, I guess we did our little relational peace last summer. I guess we did our little, our little periodic relational emphasis last summer. And now we're into theology. No, it doesn't work like that. The only theology that counts for anything is Philippians 2 kind of theology and Gospel of John kind of theology. And both of them are delivered in the New Testament to uphold relational transformation. It's it's just crystal clear in Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves which you saw when Jesus was incarnate, the Word became flesh. And John, if you read this this big chapter now, I mean this is a big book, 21 chapters long, and he gets to chapter 13. By this they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Or chapter 15, verse 12. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than that he lay down his life for friends. The Gospel of John and the book of Philippians are both massively theological to the end that we as a church would grow in our capacities to love each other and our enemies better. So please, do not have the mindset nor nor cease to pray for me that our years-long tenure in the Gospel of John will be anything other than an advancement through right theology of greater love, greater kindness, greater gentleness, greater patience, greater meekness, greater coming out of ourselves greater courage to say the hard thing and say it tenderly all the things that make make a church work as something unusual from the world more servant like less proud less selfish less withdrawn more caring we don't have to Leave the Gospel of John in order to do that. It's right here. So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us is exactly the truth that Paul used to transform the Philippian church. So that they would stop thinking so much about their own interests only and start being interested in other people. So we're not away. We're just right there again. So the question is, I've just been telling you why I'm asking the question, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us that the Word became flesh? Well, verse 14 says this, we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It means that in Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. It means that the glory of God in Jesus did not come to consume us, but it came full of grace and truth. The glory of God in Christ is his gracious disposition toward us without compromising his truthfulness, his faithfulness to himself. Why does he use the word full? Full of grace and truth? 
because it's really, 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 really big. If you have a container as big as Jesus, the Word eternally who created all things, and it's full of grace and truth, that's a lot of grace. This is really good news. It could have been otherwise, couldn't it? God could have chosen to become flesh as a judge and an executioner. He could have just said, in the fullness of time, I'm done. I've been working with this planet for thousands of years. And what do I get? No fruit. I'm done. And I'm sending a judge. He will do that. But he didn't do it. The Son of Man did not come to condemn, but to save. John 3.17 He came full of grace and truth the first time. We live in that period between the two comings of the king. He came full of grace and truth. The word became flesh to be gracious to us. And it was grace shaped by truth and not compromising truth. It's not wishy-washy grace. It's not unprincipled grace. It's not sentimental grace. There's a lot of sentimental grace in the world. And so many people don't have a biblical understanding of, of God's grace. Paired with truth and always vindicating truth and always holding fast to God's truthfulness and His faithfulness to His own infinite worth and glory. It will be a righteous grace, a God-exalting grace, a costly grace. This grace is going to lead straight to the cross because at the cross is the only place where truth can stand if grace is going to stand. God cannot justly simply wipe away your sin and my sin. If he comes with grace to save sinners, he cannot, and this is, this is what the world doesn't get without our helping them and teaching them. This doesn't, these categories are not in the natural mind. He cannot simply say, we will let bygones be bygones. Because truth, faithfulness, truthfulness means My glory has been defamed. My name has been trampled in the dirt. My purposes have been rejected. My justice calls for punishment. That's real wrath. And and yet he's so gracious. He's so full of grace. So what does he do? He clothes himself with flesh that he may die. The reason the Word became flesh is so that when the Son of God goes to the cross and dies, grace could abound and truth could be upheld. Truth is upheld because sin is punished and grace abounds because we don't get punished. He gets punished. That's why he came. That's why he had to have flesh. So nails could go through it. So his side could be pierced according to prophecy. So blood and water could flow out. So he could become a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's the main reason he took on flesh. So if if you ask the question, what difference does verse... 14 make for us it makes all the difference in the world for us we see his glory and it is a glory as of the only son and what marks the glory it is full of grace 
and it does not compromise. 